is even better. All right. What's going on, buddy? What's going on, buddy? Don't you love it? You know you love it. All right. Yep, I'm live right now. What's going on with you? Yep, I'm live right now. What's going on with you? Yep, I'm live. Okay, welcome. Man, I'm getting handsomer. Keep praying for me, guys. All right, good to see you. Okay, good to see you guys. Yeah, I know, last minute. I'm not. I'm out of state. What's up, Jeremy? What's up, buddy? I'm at my friend's house, so I'm using his internet. Pray by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that the internet connection will go smooth. The connectivity stays strong. Thank you. Well, pray. Ask the Lord Jesus to help me to get my health back in Jesus' name for the glory of Jesus, to be handsome, to be beatified with the beauty of Jesus. Come on. And be holy unto the Lord Jesus. Come on. Don't hate I gotta get my muscles back, man. Yeah, I'm sure. All right, you guys can hear me, right? I don't, I don't want to get too loud. This is about as loud as I can get, right? I don't know. Uh, make me. You look like you're a sister. Are you? I haven't been able to hit the weights yet. Thank you, Abraham Gill. Uh, so, how much do I need to punch? Before I can move my pics like you well the picture there because remember I can't see the picture too clearly it looked like Looks like a woman with glasses. Sorry Sorry about that. I don't mean to insult you, but your picture. It's very small and tiny. So You know All right Sorry, don't get offended at me All right This is last minute impromptu, so I don't know how many people are gonna show up, but how do I look? How do I look? Andrew, you asking me how do I? Yeah, so Protestants here, praise the Lord Jesus. He's going to be posting verses for us. So wait a few more minutes. I'm going to continue discussing, can God the Father be seen? And I'm going to come back live tonight, God willing. Lord Jesus willing, I'll be live again tonight. So I'm going to do another show tonight. Okay, so... And what does that mean? James White only fan here. And so why would you be here in my page? Okay, so if I look okay, Magnus, and you're fit than me. Do these people make sense today? One guy's telling me James White only fan here. Because he just wants to instigate, cause division. And someone says, I look okay, but he's more fit than me. Does that make sense? Uh, Joseph the Dreamer, you can't love me if you're a James White only fan. So you don't even make sense. If you're a James White only fan, that means you only love James White. So do you understand English or do you need someone to interpret for you? Yeah, uh, what, what do you do with these kind of people? All right, folks. I want to continue discussing 54, so what do you do? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, buddy, why don't I send you to Arizona? Here. You tell me this guy's not a devil, a little demon, another barking dog. Yep, there you go. Yep. You keep dreaming, buddy. No, I'm not sad, buddy. 
I'm at my friend's house and he's taking a nap. I remember I'm away at a conference that I've been trying to get on to do some shows. So I have some time right now. So Basirat Balugan, you miss doing live shows, me doing live shows with David Wood. So it means if I do shows on my own, you don't miss those? Okay, good to know. Guys, are we almost ready? We're almost ready? Yeah, I, I prefer to be free and speak loud, but I can't. He's sleeping, taking a nap. Well, Daily Light, keep praying for me that God will fight for me in the court system. Set me free for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay, folks, we love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you, Holy Spirit. We, know, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. We love you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please, I ask that you take over this session. I truly need to be filled with your presence, to be empowered, <clears throat> to glorify Jesus Christ. So, Holy Spirit, I need you. Please grant me clarity of thought and speech. Save me from confusion. Save me from stammering. Save me from stumbling and stuttering. Please, Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus it is you who glorifies Jesus Christ through us. It is you who sanctifies us. It is you who unites us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is you who perfects us and transforms us and purifies us in the holy blood of Jesus Christ. We love you. We are in love with you. Fill us, Holy Spirit. We need you. I need you not just to teach, but to live for Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, please crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, and Destroy the fruit of our flesh and fill us with fruit from your presence, Holy Spirit, with life from your presence, Holy Spirit, with power and love and wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your glorious presence. Fill us, Holy Spirit. And I pray that you fill my daughters, fill our loved ones, and please grant me clarity of thought and speech. Anoint my words to glorify Jesus Christ, the Father's beloved Son, the very heart of the Father who became flesh, our God and Savior. Protect us from the attacks of the enemy. Protect me from confusion, from misinterpreting scripture, and bless the people of the living God, the household of the living God, the children of the living God, born by your power, born from you, Holy Spirit, united to the Lord Jesus Christ by your power. Seal us for the glory of Jesus Christ and destroy distractions. I truly need you, Holy Spirit. Please work through me and give us the power, not just to speak the word, but to live the word, to obey you perfectly, to be in love with you, to be in love with Jesus Christ, our Lord and save us from the attacks of the enemy. Save me from my own flesh and give us victory. Give me victory and cover us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you. We need you. We depend on you. You are the eternal spirit of the Father and the eternal spirit of the Father, Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our God, our Lord, our love, our life, our creator, maker, provider, sustainer, savior, redeemer, are all in all, one with the Father and the Son, we confess you. In Jesus' name, yeah, hope my Father, Holy Spirit. Let's see if we can get over a hundred. <clears throat> uh, uh, Allah Shin, please do not ask me a question that I already dealt with and went in depth in previous sessions. Exodus thirty three twenty was already dealt with in great depth in part one. If you actually continue reading Exodus thirty three twenty. And don't stop there, but go to 23. The same God who tells Moses that you cannot see my face tells Moses, you will see my back parts. So if you're new here, be patient. Don't chime in. Listen attentively. Pray the Holy Spirit will fill every one of us and fill the speaker to bless you in the power of the Spirit. To glorify Jesus Christ. Right? So you can understand. Obviously... It doesn't literally refer to God's face because God is spirit and God is spirit by nature doesn't have a literal face or literally <clears throat> back backside, right? He doesn't have that. So obviously when it says seeing the face of God or the back part of God, it has to mean something other than the actual physical face of God, physical back of God, because God is spirit. And by spirit, that means that God is, <clears throat> who created all time, space, and place. As the Lord Jesus anoints me, washes us in his holy blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, I plead to cover us and our loved ones, my daughters, 
and just to fill us with the Holy Spirit to do justice to this topic, please, Lord Jesus. Again, I ask you and I beseech you for your grace because this is a very deep, sensitive topic, and I'm trusting the Lord Jesus by his Spirit to guide me. Since God created time, space, and place, that means God by nature is timeless. God by nature is spaceless. God by nature is placeless, meaning he doesn't occupy time, space, and place because he exists before time, place, and space. So he's immaterial, incorporeal, meaning he's not a material being with a material body, a spatial body, a body that limits him to time, space, and place. But he can enter into his creation. He can enter into time, interact with time that he created, experience time, and he can assume <clears throat> visible forms, manifest certain forms and shapes in his creation so that people can see God in that <clears throat> manifestation, in that form, in that shape, though God by nature is shapeless, formless, and spaceless. Everyone with me there? <clears throat> Do you, you understand the point before I move on? No, not all theophanies are Christophanies. No, make me. Instead of asking questions, go back and listen to part one and be patient. Let's trust the Holy Spirit to guide this conversation so I can go deep into the scriptures. Now, I want to make sure that everyone understand what I just said about God by nature. So when you talk about God's face, if God by nature is spaceless, if God by nature is immaterial, incorporeal, timeless, placeless, then he can't have an actual literal face or an actual literal back, right? So these obviously have to be metaphors, <clears throat> expressions that are pointing to something other than God having an actual face like angels do or humans do or animals do or back, right? Clear? Is that clear? I just want to make sure those of you who are listening are getting this. And Protestant believer, you're here, right? Okay. Man, it's kind of hot in here, but that's fine. Okay. I did want to answer two questions before I go into the subject. I was chided by someone for using the Jehovah Witness Bible, the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses, to prove my position, to prove my argument that... The two messengers slash angels of Genesis 19 are not spirit creatures, angelic creatures, but most likely are the Son and the Holy Spirit who appeared on earth in the form of men along with the Father, and that those two then brought fire from Jehovah God the Father who had returned to heaven to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah as the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit were on earth <clears throat> in human form. <clears throat> appearing as men. So I got chided. Why would you use? Again, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me. Please guide me, Holy Spirit, to bless the people of God and save me from error, to glorify Jesus Christ. Why would I use the Bible of Joe's Witnesses? My answer was the same reason why the beloved Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and my prayer for every one of us, my prayer for all of you and me, from my heart is, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, make us more like the Apostle Paul, to worship you, to love you, to obey you, to fear you, to praise you, to live for you, to proclaim your glory, your gospel, and die for you like the Apostle Paul, in Jesus' name, right? Now, Paul, who's my hero, quoted the sources the scholars, the philosophers, the prophets, the theologians of the very people that he was reaching with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He would quote to the Greeks their own authorities, their own sources, their own philosophers, and their own so-called prophets. Not because Paul believed that these men or these sources were inspired by God, but Paul realized that... <clears throat> 
the audience that he's reaching to believed these sources to be authoritative. And therefore, he could use those sources when they would say things that were true and perfect agreement with God's revelation to make his case to prove his point. Everyone with me there? So we learn from the example of Paul, who was inspired by the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, that we can actually use the very sources, the very scholars, the very literature of that particular people group or that religious group to bring them to the truth of the gospel and to prove the truth of the gospel if their source says something that agrees with the truth of God revealed in Jesus Christ and preserved in the Holy Bible. Now, let me give you the proof. Let's go to Acts 17, verse 28. So let me answer that objection, and I'm going to answer another objection, and we go into the topic. <clears throat> Acts 17, 28. Let me know if I'm boring you guys. I can't be too loud and animated unless the Holy Spirit just takes over and makes me animated anyway because I'm at my brother's house, meaning my brother in Christ, and he's taking a nap. Acts 17, 28. For in him... Now, Paul is quoting a Greek poet here. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Did you see what Paul just did, folks? In Jesus' name, in less than a year, in about six months, I'm going to get my health back and my shape back in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit. Okay, did you see what Paul just did? He just cited one of the po poets of the Athenians, here he's preaching to the Greeks in Athens, an Athenian poet or a poet that the Athenians looked to whose writings were authoritative for them. And he says, as even one of your own poets realized and recognized that we are all the offspring of God. God is the one who created us. God is the one who gives us life. He sustains us. He provides for us. And he wants us to know him and reach out to him. Now, folks, you know what's interesting about that citation? Get any good Bible commentary or study Bible. They'll even give you the reference, the name of the poet and the citation from the writing of that poet. Did you know that if you go back and read that reference, you know that poet when he said we are all his offspring? You know that poet was referring to who? Does anyone know? which God the poet was referring to when he made that statement? Anyone? In Jesus' name, over 100 for your glory. Anyone? When he said, we are all his offspring, and he's quoting a Greek poet, that poet was referring to who? Come on, someone tell me. Don't go to sleep on me. Zeus, Mickey Ephrata, got it. Make me, got it. Zeus, Diana, Diana's a goddess. How can we be the offspring of a goddess, Protestant believer? You're hurting me. You're disappointing me. I want to lay hands on you, lay you out, and fire you. How could we be the offspring of Diana, Artemis, a goddess, when he's referring to God? But... In the context, the poet was referring to Zeus because among the Greeks and the Romans, the Romans called him Jupiter. Zeus was known as the father of the gods. In fact, the names of Zeus in Greek were Ha Theos and Ha Pater. Are you with me there? I'm, I'm, make sure you give me your undivided attention. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to illuminate us, to understand these issues for the glory of Jesus Christ. The Greeks would call Zeus the father of the gods. And so in Greek, he was called Ha Theos, right? And Ha Pater. Ha Theos, Ha Pater. Ha Theos, Ha Pater means the God, the Father. Isn't it interesting that the very words Ha Theos and Ha Pater are used of the Father of Jesus Christ in the Greek New Testament? Isn't it interesting? And isn't it interesting that Paul took a quote by a Greek poet? who's talking about Zeus, but took that very citation and applied it to the true God revealed in Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul just gave us a basis to quote sources like the Quran and quote the Quran saying something about Allah and applying it to the true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, 
the true God revealed in Jesus Christ, the true God re revealed in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, to make our point without this assuming that all of the Quran is the true God. Because Paul did not think for a moment that Zeus was the true God, the father of Jesus. He knew Zeus was a false God, a demon, an evil spirit, if not Satan, masquerading as a God. But he could still take that statement and say, that statement that we are all his offspring, that's true, but it's not true of Zeus. It's true of this unknown God who's unknown to you, but known to me, and I'm making him known to you. You understand that or no? See what he did? So if someone tells you, why would you quote the Jehovah's Witness Bible? Why would you quote the Quran? Why would you quote the Book of Mormon? Because the apostles did that. They would quote the sources of the people they're reaching. If those sources said something that agreed with the perfect revelation of Jesus Christ in order to convince people to come to the truth of the gospel. Right? Do you understand that point? Sure, exactly, King of Kings. We've Christianized it, and there's nothing wrong with it, right? As long as it's not promoting immorality, right, or the worship of false gods and goddesses. Okay, now let me give you another example where Paul quotes, this time, a false prophet. He quotes a false prophet, Titus 1.12. Uh, France Tuma, did Paul care whether the Greeks thought he was cherry picking? So France Tuma, answer your own question. I'm going to let you answer your question. Was Paul wondering, hmm, would those Greeks think I'm cherry picking? Answer your own question, France Tuma. Go ahead. Okay, so why ask me the question? I'm just wondering, bro. Won't the Muslims think we're cherry picking? Why are you concerned what they're going to think when I'm giving you the example of Paul, who's inspired by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and holy apostle, given revelation, mm -hmm. that is the foundation of our faith and that we're supposed to build on? Do you understand or no? Okay. Not too, am I too loud? Yeah. Friends, uh, uh. Okay. You with me there, friends? Before I move on to the next point. Okay, but now to answer your question. To answer your question, friends. I'm not cherry picking because if a Muslim says, why are you quoting the Quran when it's convenient for you to do so, but then reject the Quran when it contradicts your theology? And my answer is very simple. I'm quoting the Quran because you believe in it, to establish my case for your benefit because you believe in it. It's not because I believe in it. In other words, if I'm talking to an atheist, I'll never quote your Quran. But you're not an atheist and you're not a Hindu. So why would I quote the Vedas to you, the Bhagavad Gita to you, if you're a Muslim who believes in the Quran and the Hadith? So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to quote what you believe to be authoritative and sources from your God to make my point, to put you in a position where you have to agree with me and cannot disagree with me. So it's not cherry picking. It's using your own authority against you to prove the truth of my position. Right? I just want to make friends, Tom, and to him I get it. That's what Paul just did to the Greeks. Now, could the Greeks tell Paul, you're wrong, we're not the offspring of God if he then quotes one of their own authority saying we are. You see what Paul is doing? He's putting them in a corner where they have to agree with his argument. They have to agree with his premise and then accept his conclusion because he's quoting a source that they accept. So they cannot say, no, we are not the offspring of God because he's quoting a source that they accept that says we are the offspring of God. But then he's correcting it by saying we are the offspring of God, but not the God you think. It's not Zeus. It's the God that I'm revealing to you, this unknown God that you are aware of but don't know much about. Do you understand now the issue? 
Well, thank you, Basara. Keep praying for me that the Spirit keeps filling me with wisdom, knowledge, and power to know the Word, to love the Word, to live the Word perfectly, proclaim it and die for the Word, the Word of the true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? Now I want to make sure friends got it. Okay, so now friends, that's what we do with the Muslims or any other group that we cite, any other group whose sources we cite. Okay, now let's see Paul quoting a false prophet to make his case against the Cretans. Titus 1.12. Titus 1.12. Is it me or is it hot in here? Is it me or is it hot? I'm like sweaty. I think it's the altitude. One of themselves. Notice, France, everyone else. Titus 1.12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, even a prophet of their own. He's quoting a prophet of the Cretans, not a true prophet of God. He goes, even one of their own, a fellow Cretan, one of their own prophets. Notice, it's not my prophet, their prophet, right? Who said, one of their own prophets said, right? <clears throat> the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Did you catch what Paul is saying? Paul is saying, look, I don't need to say anything negative about you. One of your own, from your own ethnic background, someone who is from your own culture, your own nationality, whom you think is a prophet, whom you accept as a prophet, you believe he's a prophet, this is what he says about you. You see his point? Ricky, yeah, I'll do that a little later. Okay, so now when someone tells you, why are you quoting the Jehovah's Witness Bible? Why are you quoting the Quran or the Hadith? Why are you quoting the Vedas? Because the apostles who were inspired by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, taught by the Spirit to lay the foundation of our faith, the foundation that's preserved in the Scriptures, the foundation we build upon, who are our examples of how to live for Jesus and glorify Jesus and proclaim Jesus and love Jesus and worship Jesus. They did that. So are you better than Paul? Are you more knowledgeable than Paul? Are you more spiritual than Peter? You got it? You understand now? As so before I move on, that's what I'm trying to hear. You, you I want to hear feedback. That's why I interact and engage a lot of comments because I want to make sure you're getting it. You're understanding the issue, right? Okay. Hey, guys, Elisha needs to go. He needs to go. He's a distraction. He's being used of the devil. He needs to get out of here. So just send him on his merry way. Yeah. yeah. Just don't let him back here anymore. Okay. Let's focus. All right. Okay. Now, another question that was asked, and I want to answer the question so we can get into the topic. Am I boring you guys with this? Are you learning how to evangelize? You're learning how to imitate the apostles and how they evangelize, learning from their example because they're filled with the Spirit, taught by the Spirit, and guided by the Spirit to preach the way they did, learning from them how to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You're learning? Budrus Dulehim, no side talk where you're distracting people because I'm going to bounce you too. Focus on the topic. This is not time to greet each other. This is not, you know, a high school reunion. This is the time to listen to the Word of God, learn, and then apply it by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. So Budra, send Budra's son his merry way. Wow is right in your face. Send him bye bye and look at his even his uh, picture. Okay, let's focus now. The second question. Why would I quote Genesis 19, 18 from the Jehovah Witness translation, which renders the Hebrew as Lot saying to Jehovah over against the King James Bible, which renders the Hebrew as Lot speaking to the two angels and calling them lords. To understand the objection, let's look at both translations and Thank the Lord Jesus for servants like Protestant believer for posting verses to make, make it easier for me to serve you for the glory of Jesus. Let's compare Genesis 19, 18 in the New World Translation. 
Al, pray hard for me to get a green light because there are some hindrances of the devil to try to stop me from coming there. But plead the blood of Jesus, Al, and have others pray. Green light so I can be there within a couple of weeks. I'll go follow the Holy Spirit. Okay. Just 1918, in the New World Translation, Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. I don't know what you're quoting here. He just threw me off. What did you just quote in the first part, Protestant believer? Hmm. He threw me off. I asked for the newer translation. That's the King James Version. You sure about that? This gentleman told me that in the King James Version, it said, Lords. Let me double check. Hold on. Let me just double check again. I got to reacquaint myself with the King James Version. This is where you threw me off. Hold on. It's not your fault. It's just again. Too much. Too much. You know, Solomon said it perfectly in Ecclesiastes 12, 12. It says, of making books, there is no end. And of much study is a weariness of the flesh. Ecclesiastes 12, 12. Of making books, there is no end. And of much study is a weariness of the flesh. Boy, <laughs> reading never ends. Writing never ends. And the more you read, the more you write, the more <clears throat> of a burden you carry the more fatigued you become. Ecclesiastes 12, 12. All right. I don't know why in the comment section he said it said lords, but oh well, be that as it may. Okay. So the point was, why would I quote Genesis 19, 18 in the Jehovah Witness Bible that reads differently from the King James Bible? Okay. Okay. Let's look at it. Let's compare Let's compare again. Genesis 1918, here's the King James Version. Thank Protestant believer he's posting it. Notice how the King James Version renders it. And Lot said unto them, Oh, no, oh, not so, my Lord. Oh, not so, my Lord. Did you catch it? The King James Version. Guys, please pay attention so we can learn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pay attention. The King James Version of Genesis 1918. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. But then the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Notice the difference. Then Lot said to them, not there, please, Jehovah. Do you see it's not the same? The King James Version renders the Hebrew as my Lord. The Jehovah's Witnesses Bible renders the Hebrew as Jehovah. So did he say to the two angels, my Lord? Or did he say to the two angels, Jehovah? All right? Everyone with me there? Well, it depends on whether you accept the Jewish tradition that says, pay attention here and listen attentively. Pay attention here and listen attentively. This is where I need you guys to listen so you can learn, so you can understand this information, use it to glorify Christ and share with Joe's witnesses. If you take the Jewish tradition that says a group of Jewish scribes, called the Safarim, Sofer, or Sofer, Anglo-Saxon pronunciation, Sofer, singular, or Sofarim, plural. If you take the Jewish translation, I'm sorry, Jewish tradition, for granted that Jewish scribes changed <clears throat> Jehovah to Adonai in 134 places. And this was covered in one of my first sessions. I already covered this, but people are not listening. According to a Jewish tradition, Jewish scribes changed Jehovah to Adonai in 134 places in the Hebrew Bible. One of those places was Genesis 19.18. According to this tradition, the Hebrew originally said Jehovah, the scribes were uncomfortable with Lot calling these angels Jehovah, so they changed it to Adonai. But what the New World Translation did was it went back and restored the name Jehovah in all 134 places. All 134 places. You with me there? Where the Jewish scribes had changed it to Adonai. You understand the difference? 
So what the society did, they took this Jewish tradition for granted. And so they went to every one of the places where Jehovah was changed to Adonai and restored it to Jehovah because in the Jewish tradition, they even name all the places where the changes occurred. The Jewish tradition even mentions every verse where the Jewish scribes changed Jehovah to Adonai. So that's why in the New World Translation says Jehovah. So then why did the King James translation render the Hebrew as my Lord? Because the King James translation was based on the Hebrew Masoretic manuscripts, and those manuscripts read Adonai, not Jehovah. Dominus telcom got it. You see the difference? So the King James Bible is simply going with the manuscripts and not with the Jewish tradition. The extent Hebrew manuscripts have Adonai in Genesis 19, verse 18. I have no idea what you mean. Rabbinical priest got a hold of Proto Canaanite. Proto Canaanite means before Canaan. And how would a rabbinical priest get a hold of something that's before the Canaanites? Okay, do you understand the difference in the King James and in the Jehovah Witness translation? The Jehovah Witness translation is not simply going by the Hebrew manuscripts, the manuscripts of the Old Testament. They're going by the Jewish tradition, which lists all the places that the Hebrew manuscripts that those Jewish scribes had in their possession, originally read Jehovah, and they changed it in their copies to Adonai. Whereas the King James is based on the extent Hebrew manuscripts. The Hebrew manuscripts, the manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible, read Adonai in Genesis 19.18. So I was only using Genesis 19.18 against the Jehovah's Witnesses to make the case that if you agree with this Jewish tradition, then you end up proving that those two angels who appeared as two men are actually Jehovah God Almighty, which means those two angels are not creatures, but must be human appearances of the Son, our Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Exactly, Andy Shannon. So Andy Shannon, you got it, basically. Yes, Dominus Telcom, you got it too. Praise the Lord Jesus for the illumination that comes from the Holy Spirit. So you understand why I went with the Jehovah Witness translation? Because if the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Genesis 19.18 originally read Jehovah, then that means they're stuck because now they have to contend with the fact that two angels that appeared as two men on earth are called Jehovah by Lot. So if they're called Jehovah and those angels do not rebuke Lot, that means they accept their identification as Jehovah, which means those are not angelic creatures. Those two must be Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit appearing on earth in human form as men. Haterwood is in the hizzy. He's hating the fact that I'm blowing up and he's decreasing. And guys, can you believe it? He'll never give a shout out on his page. Hey, go go listen to Sam live, the man who taught me everything I know, even though I dropped the ball and I embarrass him because I can't live up to his standard. Okay? Okay, now, besides the distraction from Haterwood, right, the white man always coming and dividing and conquering, you guys understand why I appealed to Genesis 19.18? Pretty soon I will blow up on Muhammad's boom boom room. So it's going to happen. Your wish will be my command. So do you understand now why I used the Joe Witness translation of Genesis 19.18? Okay. Now, can I still... Make the same argument, same point, using the King James Bible. If I just stuck with the King James Bible, could I make the same argument that the two men who appeared were not angelic creatures, but two of the three divine persons of the Godhead, namely the Son and the Holy Spirit, who appeared on earth as men in human form, even though they didn't actually become human by nature. They simply appeared in human form. Yes, I can. And here, let me show you why. Let's go to Genesis 19.18 in the King James Bible. 
No, not because of all caps, Jeremy. When the word Jehovah is used in the Hebrew, then the translators will translate it in all capitals in English. But when it's another word, the word Lord, right, won't be all capitals. When the word Jehovah appears in the Hebrew, Yod, He, Vav, He, the four consonants known as the Tetragrammaton, then the English translation will render the word Lord in all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. But when it's another word, then the term Lord won't be all caps. So that's not the reason, Jeremy. Pay attention, Genesis 19.18. The word Lord there is not all capitals. So that does not make the case, right? Because in Genesis 19.18, here the Hebrew does not use the tetragrammaton, the divine name, the four Hebrew consonants, yod He, vav He, because in Hebrew it's Adonai. Okay, look at Genesis 19.18. And if you look at the Hebrew, you can also get the interlinear on BibleHub.com. The word is not Jehovah, Yahovah, yod He, vav He in Hebrew. It's Adonai. That's why the King James did not render the word Lord in all capitals. Did you notice? Only the L is capital. Can you guys hear the background, by the way? You guys hear the background noise? A little bit? Okay. I'll probably have to move. Okay. Okay, so but hopefully it's not distracting because this is going to be archived on my YouTube page. You Now you see why I can't get more than 10,000 people. All right. Okay. Everyone with me here? How are you, sister? Sorry. Okay, so did you see the word Lord is not all capitals? Do you see it's capital L, lowercase o, lower, lowercase r, lowercase d? You guys see it, right? Okay. So can I still use the King James rendering of Genesis 1918? Can I still use the King James rendering of Genesis 1918 to prove that these two persons are not creatures but members of the Godhead? Can I? Yes, you can. And the reason why you can is twofold. Number one, even as the Unitarian heretics will admit, for example, Anthony Buzzard will admit that the word Adonai is always used of Jehovah. That's one of their arguments. Remember, let me turn the argument against the Unitarian heretics like Anthony Buzzard. Anthony Buzzard argues that Adonai always refers to the true God, whereas Adoni refers to a human Lord, a human master, or an angelic creature. But Adoni is never used for the true God. Guess what, folks? Genesis 19.18 uses Adonai, the very word that Unitarian heretics, these fake Christians, Bible perverters, admit is used of the true God, Jehovah. You with me there? Stand by here. Oh, my Hold on, let me do that. You get it? So even according to their argument. Okay, hold on. Let me know if you guys can hear me. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me? Even according to their own argument, the word Adonai is the word used for Jehovah God in contrast to the word Adoni. Let me transliterate. Adonai is transliterated in the following way. A-D-O-N-A-I or A-D-O-N-A-Y. They say that word, Adonai, is always used of Jehovah and only for Jehovah. In contrast to Adoni, A-D-O-N-I, that is never used of Jehovah, so they claim, even though they're wrong. It's only used of human masters or angelic creatures. Well, guess what? 
Genesis 19.18 uses the word Adonai, not Adoni. Exactly, Jeremy. That's just one of their pathetic attempts of trying to deny that Jesus is God in the flesh. But taking their argument at face value, right? Just giving them the argument, for argument's sake, agreeing with them, going along with them. They just admitted that in Genesis 19.18, since the word Adonai is used, that means Lot is calling those two <clears throat> angels the true God. Because if they are right that Adonai is only used for the true God, then in Genesis 19.18, those two are called Adonai by Lot, proving those two must be the true God, Jehovah. They can't hear, so if you guys want to talk, feel free, because they can't hear now. So be free. Sorry for disturbing you guys. I apologize. We have, I have a gracious host that are allowing me to use their internet to teach you guys. So pray for them. Can I tell them who we are? Uh, I'm at the home of a dear brother who used to be a Shia Muslim, who's now a born-again Christian, spirit-filled, in love with Jesus, him and his wife. They're on fire for Jesus, and they are hosting me. Even though to have me in your home, you know, great is the reward because of the trials that you must endure to even be in my presence for more than an hour. <laughs> no, it's uh, Muhammad Faridi and his better half, his lovely wife, the gift from the Lord Jesus. What's the ministry called so they can know? His ministry is called Iranian, Iranian Christian International. He's actually on Facebook. I did a series with him of small segments. And Lord Jesus willing, we're going to be doing a conference this Saturday. So pray for the brother, Muhammad Faridi. He's on Facebook. He's got a YouTube channel, right? He is a former Iranian Shia Muslim who now worships Jesus in love with Jesus. And the Lord has blessed him with a Proverbs 31 wife who serves with him to glorify Jesus Christ or bless them, bless, pray for them and bless them and their provision that God will seal them and provide for them and use them mightily and pray I can be a blessing to them. And so they're being gracious enough to allow me to use their home to teach you, right? They didn't have to do this. So thank Jesus Christ for the hospitality that he puts in the hearts of the members of the body of Christ so that we can love one another and serve one another for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, yeah, and why don't you, you can actually show up if you want to say hi. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to let you see him. He said he's okay on being on camera. He's not camera shy. He's not like Jeremy, who's camera shy. Too shy to shy, hush, hush, adwa. Too shy to shy. Okay, they want to say hi to you. Come on, brother. I think they are. Yeah, he's coming, yeah. So I'm going to repeat the point. Just bear with me. Yeah. Al, that's the beautiful thing, Al about being born of the spirit belonging to jesus christ and into a spiritual body you have brothers and sisters who because they're born of the same spirit who love the same jesus who will love you and serve you no matter where you go no matter where we go i can be in texas and there are brothers and sisters in jesus christ ready to serve me and i serve them because we're born of the same spirit united to the same jesus and belong to the same body and jesus commands that we love one another and serve one another so see how much the Lord is amazing? Okay, hold on. Uh, let me take this up. Do you, do you see him? You're going to show up in a minute. Okay, that's him right there. Hold on. Did it freeze? Okay. That's our brother. You can say it. They can say it. They can hear you. Say hi. Hello, guys. Yeah, don't look you here because it's like a second. I like, see. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about that. Just keep talking. Um, I wrote this a small book. Can they hear me? Yeah, of course. Okay. Hear, yeah. So I wrote this a small book called Forsaking My Father's Religion. And uh, you can, uh, if you write me, I will send it to you for free. You can, or you, I can, if you email me or find me on Facebook. If you do look at the um, spelling of the name, it's different than the regular Arabic way. Yeah, they can see it. They'll see, it. even though it's too bright here, they'll see. I it. see. Yeah, they they see it perfectly. You can find my, my on my Facebook. If you uh, write me on my Facebook or send an email. I'll send a PDF to you. Okay, give me your email slowly. If you want the PDF copy, either find him on Facebook, pray for him, his wife, their ministry, or email him. Here's the email slowly. Give it to them. So the email is dnmi at yahoo.com. Repeat it again. D-N-M-I. So D-S-D for Denmark, N for Nancy, M for Mary, I for India, dot 
at yahoo.com. Okay, so they sell it. So pray for this brother. <clears throat> He's been putting up with me in my trials for this week and been a gracious host, him and his wife. Pray for their ministry to explode for the glory of Jesus. Pray for their provision. Pray for their health. Pray I can be a blessing to them because now they're allowing me to use their internet in their home and conveniencing them to bless you. See how selfish you guys are? All right. Bless you guys. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. So we're almost done. What time we're heading out? What time we're going to head out? Okay. Lord willing, I'm going to do a part two tonight because I've got to be out in 20 minutes. So let me finish this point with, with the King James Version. And God willing, later tonight I'll have more, more time, and I can probably do it in the room so I won't disturb them. Let me go back to the issue again. Can you use Genesis 1918 to prove that those two angelic messengers were not spirit creatures but human appearances manifestations of the second and the third members of the godhead meaning the son the lord jesus and his pre-human existence and the holy spirit yes you can and i gave you one of the arguments what was the argument remember the argument even according to unitarian heretics like anthony buzzard don't take my word for it don't take my word for it google it go on their websites go on their youtube page their, one of their chief arguments is the word Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-Y, sometimes transliterated as A-D-O-N-A-I, is always used of the true God. <clears throat> it's the word Adoni, A-D-O-N-I, A-D-O-N-I, that's used of human masters or angelic creatures and never used of the true God. Well, now this backfires against them. Because in Genesis 1918, the two messengers are called Adonai, meaning according to them, that means Lot was calling them Jehovah God. And notice he called them, not just one of them, both of them Adonai. Let's look at the verse again, Genesis 1918. Let's look at it again. Can you send Mahi ministries to Hades where he belongs? Send them on his merry way. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Oh, not so, my Lord. Now, notice, is he speaking to one of them or both of them and addressing both of them as my Lord? He's calling both of them Adonai, right? In fact, that's why in some English versions, in some English versions, Aaron, ask me that question a third time and you'll be blocked. So go ahead and make my day. In some English versions, it actually renders it in plural. Not so, my lords. Not so, my lords. Because the context makes it clear. He's not referring to one of them. He's referring to both of them and calling both of them Adonai. Right? And I don't want to confuse you guys. Yep, send this guy on his merry way, please. Send him to Sheol. The son of Satan. Okay, so now that you get it, it is quite clear he's calling both of them Adonai, which according to even these Unitarian heretics is the name used for Jehovah. And they'll even say it's only used for Jehovah. Well, thank you for proving that these two must be Jehovah God, so it must be the Son and the Spirit appearing on earth in human form. Now the second argument that you can make from the King James Bible that those two, everyone listening to me, that those two are Jehovah God, are in fact Jehovah God. The second argument is that in the context, the two messengers are the ones who destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, even though we're told that it is Jehovah who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So are you now ready for the second argument that you can use from the King James Bible to prove those two messengers are not angelic creatures, but human appearances of the second and third members of the Godhead on earth. Are you ready for the second argument? The proof. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. Don't get distracted by agents of Satan. Focus on the word. Ask the spirit to fill you and help you understand the word of God for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay. The second argument is this. The context shows those two messengers will be personally responsible for destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, even though we're told it's Jehovah who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now let's look at the evidence because my time is fleeting and we need to go. Genesis chapter 19, we're going to read 12 to 24. Genesis 19, 12 to 24 from the King James Bible, not the Jehovah Witness Bible. 
And Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to do a third session later tonight, if you guys are up for it, God willing, in about three hours. Read with me, folks, please read. Read with me. And the men said unto Lot, notice the men are speaking, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Now notice what they're going to say. Pay attention. Verse 13. For we will destroy this place. Guys, reread that. Verse 13. For we, him and I, both of us, we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, meaning Jehovah, right? <clears throat> and Jehovah hath sent us to destroy it. Reread 13. We're going to destroy this place. Jehovah sent us to destroy it. So we will destroy Sodom because Jehovah sent us to destroy it personally. Okay. Now let's read 14 down. Okay. Pay attention. Let's read 14 down. Okay. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for Jehovah will destroy the city. Wow. Lot, what are you doing? The two men said, Jehovah sent us. To destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, we will destroy it. He says Jehovah is going to destroy it. Now, pay attention. I don't want to confuse you. Well, someone will say, "Well, that's agency again." That's what these Unitarian heretics will say. That's the concept of shal uh, um, shaliach, shaliach, meaning because these two men are acting on behalf of Jehovah, they are Jehovah's agents. So that you can say that Jehovah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even though it was his agents who did so on his behalf. And that's true. There are a lot of places in the Bible where Jehovah takes responsibility, God takes responsibility for actions committed by others that he himself never, never personally did. So that is true. Sometimes a person does X, and then that action, that X is attributed to Jehovah, even though Jehovah never did it. So is this a case in which the actions of these messengers are attributed to Jehovah, even though it wasn't Jehovah who did it, because they were acting on his behalf? Is that what's happening here? You guys with me here? Is that what's happening here? Is it simply two creatures acting on Jehovah's behalf, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah on his behalf, which is why it can be said that Jehovah did it? Contextually, no. Contextually, that interpretation won't work. It will work in other places. In other places, yes, the action of someone is attributed to God, even though God never personally carried out that action. So the Bible will use that language, but not here. In this case, you can't explain away the language as simply shaliach, meaning agency. Am I confusing you? Or are you understanding what I'm getting at? You can't simply say, well, because they are creatures who are representing God, they are God's agents, so their actions can be ascribed to God even though God didn't do it. That explanation will not work here. That explanation will not work here. Do you know why it won't work here? Let's pick it up at 14 to 24, and you'll see why. But I'm going to show you why that won't work, medic. It will not work here. Not so much Adonai, Protestant believer. No, well, that's begging the question, Jeremy. They'll tell you, prove they're not created. They are creatures who represent God and can be called God as his representatives. That's not going to work. But here is the proof why they can't be mere creatures representing God. Let's read 14 to 24. You guys got to pay attention, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to illuminate me, to illuminate you, to speak clearly so I don't confuse you. <clears throat> okay. Genesis 19, 14 to 24. Here's why it won't work. Okay. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, get, up, get out. Man, I got to reacquaint myself with the King James Bible and Shakespearean English because we would say, get up. Here it says, up, get you out of this place. For Jehovah will destroy the city. So that's what Lot is saying, his family members. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Now read with me. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. So the angels are rushing Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, 
and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, Jehovah being merciful unto him. Hmm. Jehovah being merciful unto him. Where did Jehovah appear? Now let's keep reading. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. Guys, you got to pay attention. Lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Adonai, not so. Don't send me there. Now let's pick it up 19 to 24. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Interestingly, though he's speaking to both of them, he uses the singular pronouns as if he's addressing only one of them. Thy means one. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, but earlier was Jehovah's mercy upon him. Remember it says, and Jehovah was merciful to him. But now Lot says to the people standing in front of him, your mercy, if your mercy is great upon me, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, this other city. And it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Now watch. And he said unto him, he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning the, this thing also. So I accept your request. That I will not overthrow this city. I will not destroy the city for the which thou hast spoken. That city, I won't destroy it for your sake. Now watch here. 22 to 24. Hasty escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Until you leave this place, I can't do anything. Sure sounds like Jesus in John 5, 19. By myself, I can do nothing. By myself, I can do nothing. I can only do what I see the Father doing. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Watch here now, 23, 24. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then Jehovah rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from Jehovah out of heaven. So the, you have Jehovah on earth and Jehovah in heaven. Clearly, those two, those two on earth are not simply agents of Jehovah because they're now identified as the Jehovah on earth who brought fire from another called Jehovah in heaven. So this goes beyond agency. This goes beyond shaliach, right? This, in other words, the text, if it's speaking of God's agents on earth and then referring to God in heaven, whom they act on, speak for, <clears throat> who sent them, then you can't speak of the agents on earth being Jehovah and then bringing fire out of another who's Jehovah. You would have to refer to the fact that these are angels who brought the fire from Jehovah, but the text says no. Jehovah, who was on earth during this time, brought fire from another who's called Jehovah, meaning it goes beyond agency. It goes beyond agency because they're being identified as Jehovah in the same context <clears throat> where another in heaven is called Jehovah. So wait. If all they are are Jehovah's representatives and his agents who are sent on his behalf to act on his behalf with his authority, then there is no need to then identify them as Jehovah on earth in the same context when you refer to the Jehovah in heaven who sent them. So then why are they still identified as Jehovah on earth as Adonai when in this passage the Jehovah who sent them is mentioned alongside of them as being in heaven? who then brought down the fire and sulfur at the order of these two on earth. You catch it now? So the two reasons why we know that these two men are not simply Jehovah's agents, but happen to be Jehovah because they're called Adonai. They're called Jehovah, even in the King James Bible, Genesis 19, 24. And they're the ones who destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, even though we're told all throughout the Bible Jehovah personally destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Jehovah personally destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, how can Jehovah have personally destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah if these two men who did the destruction were not Jehovah and simply Jehovah's agents? Okay? Are you with me there? It makes sense or did I confuse you? Okay. 
Now I'm going to give you proof. Jehovah himself personally destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, not some agents representing Jehovah, that it was Jehovah himself who did the destruction, not some agents. Okay, here's the proof. First proof, Amos chapter 4, verse 11. Here God is speaking. Pay attention to the language of God. Guys, this is where you're going to really need to pay attention. Ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your minds, to see. Holy Spirit, this is your word. Help me see, believe it, love it, and live it out. Amos 4.11. Let's see if you catch it. God is speaking. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith Jehovah. Okay, now I'm confused. Jehovah said, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is Jehovah referring to someone else as God who did the destruction? Why didn't he say, I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom? Why does he say, I did to you, Israel, what God had done to Sodom and Gomorrah? Even though it's God speaking. What's going on here? Did you catch it? Jeremiah 50, verse 40. Jeremiah 50, verse 40. Yep, the Old Testament prophets knew that God was multi-personal. He wasn't a singular person. Jeremiah 50, verse 40. God speaking again. Guys, pay attention. God speaking again. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities thereof, saith Jehovah, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Okay, I'm confused again. Here Jehovah again refers to someone else as the God who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities thereof, saith Jehovah. Did you catch it? So Jehovah is quite clear. God himself, God personally destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and not some created agent. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities, saith Jehovah. So all throughout the Bible, it is Jehovah God who personally destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet in these passages, there's someone else who is Jehovah, who is God, referring to what God did. So Jehovah God says, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah as I destroyed some of you. Why did he simply say, I destroyed some of you as I destroyed so Sodom and Gomorrah? Are you guys catching it? Finally, Isaiah 13 17 to 19. Isaiah 13, 17 to 19. We're almost done. Isaiah 13, verses 17 to 19. So you can use the King James Bible to prove that's the Trinity in Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Isaiah 13, verses 17 to 19. But I want you to pay attention again. Please pay attention and follow. And then I want to show you from the New Testament who destroyed it. Behold, I, notice God speaking, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, Al, everyone else help me understand. Why is God again speaking of someone else as God that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Did you catch it? Three Old Testament passages in which Jehovah God is the speaker and speaks of someone else distinct from him as the God who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you help me understand? Is this mind-blowing or what? Now, let me show you that one of the persons of God that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah was definitely Jesus Christ. So the Jehovah in heaven who brought the fire and sulfur was the Father, and the Jehovah on earth was Jesus along with the Holy Spirit. Now, let me prove that to you. Are you ready? Jude chapter 1, Jude chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Let's go slow and almost done. Jude 1. Exactly, Al Dariush. 
Jude 1, verses 4 and 5. Let's read slowly because I want you to see who the Lord is here. Okay. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into less viciousness. That's meaning hedonism, a party lifestyle. Now watch here. Denying uh, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice they denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice the Lord here is Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget who the Lord here is, Jesus Christ, because the Greek word there is uh, kyrios or kurios. The other term for Lord where it says only Lord God, it's despotes. Now, when you see that word only Lord God, the phrase Lord God is despotes theos or despotain theon. That phrase, our Lord Jesus Christ, the word Lord Jesus Christ, the word Lord is kurios, kyrios, kurios, okay? So if I ask you, according to verse 4, who is Kurias? Who is Kirius? Jesus Christ, right? Okay, let me spell this out. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. The word for Lord there is Kirius or Kurias. Kirius, Kurias. There, the Kirius, Kurias is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. In the first line where it says, only Lord God... There, the word Lord is not uh, kirius or kurios, it's despotes. It's two different words, okay? No, you are your own dog. You're born of a dog, and you are your own dog, a son of Satan. Send this guy to Sheol. Okay, so are you, as everyone understand, when it says our only Lord God, there the word Lord is despotes. Where we get despot. The second occurrence where it says our Lord Jesus Christ, there the word Lord is Kirius Kurias. So in Jude, the Kurias or Kirius is Jesus Christ, right? Everyone with me there? You understand what I'm getting at? Yes, it's the Greek. You can look at it at Biblehub.com. Make me. Okay, buddy. You got to leave, my friend. Please uh, make me. Don't come back, okay? You did such a good job playing the devil's advocate that you just got yourself blocked. Okay. Don't ever come back here. Okay. Thank you. Keep doing that, huh? Keep doing a good job of playing the devil's advocate. Sorry. You did such a good job, you're out of here. Yes. Okay. Jude 1, 4, and 5. Jude 1, 4, and 5. Okay. The the kurios or kurios is Jesus Christ. Our Lord, Jesus Christ. The word there is kurios. Kurios, kurios. Okay. Now let's read. Jude 1, 4. The grace of our God into last, last viciousness. I have a hard time pronouncing it. Lasciviousness. Lasciviousness which means hedonism, a party lifestyle, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Pay attention, our Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord is kurias, okay? The Lord, their Lord is kurias. So it's our kurias, Jesus Christ, our kirius, Jesus Christ. So if I asked you, who's our kirius in this context? Who's our kirius? Who is our Lord? Kirius, kurias, Erasmian pronunciation, according to verse four. Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ, correct? Okay. Now let's read five. Let's read five. Okay, good. You got it. Sorry that I have to get technical. I don't want to, but I need to, to bring out the point. Five, it then says, now watch, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, the Greek word is kurios, kurios, the Lord, the Kurias, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Now, according to verse 4, who is the Lord, the Kurias, Kirius, that destroyed the Israelites for their rebellion after he brought them out of Egypt? Who is it? See, Mickey's not paying attention. Oh, boy. Tony's not paying attention. If in verse 4, the kurios, 
Kurius is Jesus Christ. And then 5 says that Kurios, Kurios, destroyed the Israelites in the desert after bringing them out of Egypt. Who is the Kurios, the Kurios, that destroyed the Israelites after bringing them out of Egypt? Did everyone get it? It's Jesus, right? It's Jesus? Are you sure? Send Aaron Zaj to Sheol, where she belongs. Okay, now six and seven then. If you got it, we're done. Six and seven. Six and seven. Okay, if you got it, we're done. Six and seven. The Kurius, Kurias, that brought Israel out of Egypt, destroyed them in the desert for their unbelief, is Jesus. He's the Kurias, Kurius. Now six and seven. Okay, six and seven. Pay attention. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he... The he there is the Lord that destroyed the Israelites in the desert after bringing them out of Egypt. The Lord Kurias, Kirius, who's identified as Jesus Christ. So Jesus, Jesus, right, reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of great day. Now notice verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. So I don't know if you got it. Jew just said the same Kurius, Kurias, that destroyed the Israelites in the desert after he brought them out of Egypt is the same Kurius, Kurias, that destroyed the angels for sinning and has now chained them in darkness, is the same Kurius, Kurias, that also destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for committing a similar sin to the angels. But that Kurias, Kurius, that did all that in verse 4 is said to be Jesus Christ. So Jude just told you, Jesus Christ is the one that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus Christ is the one that destroyed the rebellious angels. And Jesus Christ is the one that saved Egypt during the time of Moses, Israel, out of Egypt during the time of Moses, and then destroyed the Israelites in the desert because of their rebellion. So according to Jude, Jesus Christ was on earth talking to Lot when he brought fire and sulfur from his father out of heaven to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And let's end it. Hosea chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. Hosea chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. And we're done. And I got to go. And I'll be back later, God willing, for another session. Lord Jesus willing. Okay, let's end it. Hosea 1, 6 to 7. Read, guys, because I got to end it right now. Read, please. Pay attention in Jesus' name. Read. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, God speaking to Hosea, call her name Lo Ruhamma, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Now, God speaking in verse 7. God speaking in verse 7. But I will have mercy. I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God. Wow. Again, he did it. He didn't say, I will save them by myself. I will save them by the Lord their God, not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horses, nor horsemen. Okay. You see what Jehovah just said? I will save them not by bow. So the bow is not Jehovah. I will not save them by the sword. The sword is not the same as Jehovah. I will not save them by battle, meaning an army. So an army is not the same as Jehovah. I will not save them by horses. Horses are, are not Jehovah. I will not save them by horsemen. Horsemen is not Jehovah. I will save them by Jehovah their God, which means just like the bow, right? <clears throat> the sword, the army, the horses, horsemen are distinct from Jehovah. The Jehovah God that Jehovah will use to save Judah is also distinct from him. I won't save them by these things. I will save them by Jehovah their God. Showing that just like these things are different from Jehovah, this Jehovah who is their God is different from Jehovah who's speaking. Did you catch it? I will save them by the Lord. Their now notice, Jehovah is saying, I'm going to save them by Jehovah their God. Meaning this Jehovah whom I'm going to use. He is their God, even though I'm Jehovah too. Lord Jesus willing, I'll see you in about three hours. Same bad time, same bad channel. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. He died. He rose again. He forever lives and will never die. And he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Wash us in your blood, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your love. Seal us by your spirit. And bless my daughters and fight for them and save us, Lord Jesus. We love you, Son of God. Maranatha. I'll see you a little later.